So good afternoon, I'm going to tell you a little bit today about testing principles. I'm indebted to Associate Professor Jan Kapiao for this material. Um, I've used a lot of it and some of this is my own. You'll see that as we go through. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the principles behind testing and then subdivide that into dynamic testing or static testing. And this is independent of the material about debugging that we also need to cover. We'll look at testing methods, black box, white box, and incremental. This is really the theory behind it, the rationale behind it, rather than the practical aspects of it. And we'll look at system testing. The first thing to note is that uh, this is about embedded systems. And embedded systems are not the same as general purpose computers. Uh, a lot of the theory that we're going to talk about will be about general purpose computers, but wherever possible I'll bring that back to embedded systems. And they're different. Embedded systems are much smaller. There's very little flexibility. They tend to be built for a particular task or set of tasks, and that's all they can do. Uh, when you take a general purpose computer, like a laptop, if that can only do one or two tasks, it's probably a waste of money. Embedded systems also have little uh, much less memory and reduced computing resources. There's fewer libraries in there. The software is more condensed. Um, there's usually less space or flexibility to do things differently, especially when we're doing um, testing or debugging. We slow things down sometimes. We'll talk about that. And this has worse consequences in embedded systems usually. So we need to be a little bit careful. It's a different world of testing in embedded systems. Testing has been around since as long as software has been around. Um, and in the early days, it was just something that people did without thinking much about it. But in the 1980s, a lot of thought, a lot of intellectual effort went into software testing. And there were rapid advances in this field. And the, the techniques that we tend to use today generally have their uh, basis, their root in the 1980s. And this is a big thing. It's big business, it's big money. Around about 40% of development costs, it says here, is spent on testing and defect removal. It's probably more than that because most people do some testing and defect removal as they go along. It's also, I think, the number one reason for missing a deadline. When the developers don't get their software working in time or don't get to the customer in time, it's usually because they didn't test things properly. Often it's because they didn't plan things properly either. That's also an associated task. They didn't really think things through. And that means that the software is low quality, it tends to lead to the failure of an entire project. Often many projects that include business processes, they include hardware and they include software, they fail because the software hasn't been tested properly. And the consequences of not testing properly can be pretty terrible. They add cost, they add time, and they make companies very embarrassed. Um, you just ask those many companies that didn't test their software properly. It can be a lot worse, though. Um, there's a list down the bottom here of some major software testing failures. One from quite recently is the Boeing 737 MAX aeroplane. Uh, software failures caused two crashes for that plane. Ariane 5 was a very cutting-edge advanced rocket um, that was developed by the European Space Agency. And the very first one of these crashed because of software problems, um, either a failure to test or a failure to manage testing properly, depending on how you look at it. The National Health Service in the United Kingdom has had a quite a long string of software failures. Um, this one that's mentioned down here is a heart patient dosage calculator. It's an automatic tool that ran on doctors' PCs. You put the patient details in, and it would tell you the dosage of heart medicine to take if for people who have heart failure or heart disease. And it got it wrong for years. Thousands of people took the wrong dosage of medication. Many people died because of this. One that affected fewer people, but more horrific, is the Therac 25. I'd like to tell you a little bit about this because it's really 
a, a shocking failure caused by software. So the Ferric 25 was a, a radiation dosage or a radiation treatment machine um, for people that have cancer. It's radiotherapy. I'm going to read you a little bit from the report on this. Um, it went into service in 1983 and it, it treated many people, most people it treated without problem. But in 1985, in June, a woman was being treated for breast cancer. She'd been prescribed 200 radiation absorbed doses, 200 rads. And she went into the machine and when it powered up, she felt tremendous heat and it burned her by something between, not 200, but between 10,000 and 20,000 rads. This lady, she lived, but she lost her left breast and the left use of her left arm. In July of the same year, a second patient was burned and she was there for a, uh, another cancer treatment and um, the thing basically burnt her and she died. In December of um, the same year, um, there was a woman who was burned when she went there for a um, treatment of her hip and the machine burnt her and caused strike marks over her skin. In the year later, in March, a patient in Texas was scheduled to receive his ninth treatment with this machine. So the first eight went great. And he was supposed to get 180 rads for a small tumour on his back. And when the machine turned on, he felt heat and pain, which was unexpected. The machine started to buzz in an unusual way. The patient began to get up off the treatment table when he was hit by a second pulse from the machine. This time, he did get up and he tried banging on the door to try to get out of this room. And he'd received a massive overdose of radiation and he died five months later after a long bout of radiation sickness. In April the, the same year, a second incident also in Texas, a patient was being treated for skin cancer on his ear. The same operator was using the machine. And when the therapy started, this patient saw bright light and he heard what sounded like eggs frying. It felt like his face was on fire. And he died three weeks later from radiation burns on the right temporal lobe of his brain. The final overdose was a year later. And, and that, that patient died also. This is strung over two years. What happened was a software bug. You can read this through the link I've given um, on this page or you can just search for Therac25. But what actually happened was that the people who'd done the testing had a test set, um, a sequence of things the testers would do. And the testers would look at the testing data uh, information and they would just type the commands in, and check them, and press enter, type the next command in, check them, press enter, and then the next command. What actually happened was that these commands caused things in the machine to rotate and mechanical things to happen inside the machine. But the key here is that the operators of the machine, when they started using the machine, they got familiar with it. They started typing the commands in really fast. And the problem came about because they were typing the commands in so fast, the machine hadn't had time to finish its mechanical setup before the beam the electron beam started to activate. The problem was that the testing didn't match how the operators used the machine. A big failure of testing. There just wasn't enough of it, and it wasn't realistic enough. You can look at that. Don't like to scare people, but this is an important topic. Unfortunately, in the real world, we can't find every defect in a system. We want to try and find as many as we can. We also don't have time to test everything. We don't have enough resources because it would take an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of resource to test everything. So we need a strategy to test just enough that we're confident we've, we've got as many bugs as possible, but not skimping so much that we uh, overlook important bugs like in the Therac 25. So the basic principles are that we create test cases and the test cases define what we expect as the behavior of some software, its output. And we test against the test cases. 
usually the test cases are written as you create the software, as you plan the software. And it's important to make sure that the test cases contain things that you expect the system to do and also things that you expect the system to not do or to handle when the input is unexpected. So basically, you ask what the system should and does do and also what it shouldn't do. And these test cases should be stored and they should be repeated and they should be tested. If anything goes wrong, the first place you look is the test cases. And when we plan the testing, we've got a plan that we will find defects. So basically, when you're doing a software development plan, plan for these errors. They will be there. And if you don't plan for them, you're going to cause yourself some trouble. So software testing can either be dynamic or static. And if it's dynamic, it can be white blocks or black box. And if it's static, it's generally some sort of code walkthrough or review, which could be automated these days. Let's look at each of these in turn. First of all, dynamic testing. Black box means that our software is like a black box, which we don't look inside. So the internal behavior of the software, the unit under test, the thing we're testing, is not something we look at. But we look closely at what's being fed into that unit and what is coming out of that unit. And we compare the output to what we expect for the input that we've given it. Now, again, we cannot test exhaustively. It's impossible to test everything in a real system. So what we need to do is trade off. We need to test enough stuff that we're confident the black box works. Okay, but not spend all of our time testing. White box testing is slightly different. We take the lid off the black box and we look inside. And we create test cases that try to exercise the internal structure. We look at the internal structure of the program and using our brains, we try to predict which parts of this program might cause problems. And then we start to test it based on that. In fact, we aim to test every part of that program every logical branch. We need to try to test everything. Again, we can't. So in practice, we test the most important things or the most likely things to cause a problem. This is a compromise. Static testing is you really get a printout of the code and you just go through line by line. Okay, that's simplistic. That could be a code walkthrough. Um, I've done this when I worked for the British government. I wrote software and I was subject to a code review. I went into a, a large meeting room and there were four people sat in front of me and I was sat there and we each had printouts of the code. And they went through line by line and they asked me to explain every line, what is it doing? Um, they didn't help me fix any of that code. The only thing they're doing there is looking quite hard for coding mishaps. The idea is to find the problems, not to fix them. And they did find problems. Their four or five brains, I can't remember exactly how many people it was, um, picked up errors and problems that my one brain had simply overlooked. So it's effective, but it's really expensive. If so many people just reading through code takes a while as well. When you're doing static testing, there's things you look for, things that we need for in our code. What can go wrong? Maybe data reference defects, where we're reading the wrong data, perhaps from the wrong place. Data declaration defects. This is where we've got a thing that holds some data, a variable or an array or memory locations that hold data, but we've defined it wrong. We declared that incorrectly, so it's the wrong size or it just doesn't hold what we think it should be holding. Computation defects are where calculation goes wrong. Comparison defects could be where we're comparing one thing to another. It might be that these things have different types and shouldn't really be compared, or perhaps they're compared in the wrong way. Control flow defects is where we think that our program is going to take a certain um, path for a particular input, and it actually takes a different path. If you look at the Ariane 5 error, the thing that caused that rocket to blow up when it was launched, that was a control flow defect. 
an inf interface defect to have problems getting the information into or out of a program. They could be the wrong type, um, the wrong speed, or anything that really um, where the program has made a particular assumption and the reality doesn't match that assumption. There's a hierarchy of testing. Um, typically, we start off with small units of, uh, of software and we test those. And when those units are tested, we're confident that they're good. We start to integrate them together and we test bigger blocks. Finally, we end up with a system which we test. When the system has been tested, we tend to give it to the customer for acceptance testing. Let's look at some of these. Unit testing is the lowest level. It's these individual units. It could just be um, a single function. It could be a few lines of code. And we usually use white box testing because we're the programmers. We look at the code. We can use white box testing. And we hope that we can get most problems in this way. If we do find a problem, it's fast and easy to fix. And we can recode it. Sometimes we can recode it when we find a problem. We recode it so that our code is resistant to defects. That means we use coding techniques that will help us not to suffer from defect in the future. The integrating testing is, uh, the integration is where we take the units and we plug them together. Uh, we might have two or more, and the, uh, sorry, the emphasis here is on testing the interface between the units. We already know the units are good, right, because we've tested them. So now we test the interface between the units and we test how they work as a whole. And we can use a bit of white box testing and a bit of black box testing here as appropriate. And as we go one level higher, system testing, we really tend to use more black box uh, methods. And what's becoming more important now is the functionality. So previously we we're looking at how something ran, how the code operated, now we're really emphasizing on, you know, does the code do what it needs to do? And that's why we tend to find defects here where the software doesn't meet the product requirements. For embedded systems, another thing is that that embedded system is going to be used somewhere. And we tend to find problems here where we put the embedded system in the place it's supposed to be used and we find it doesn't fit or it doesn't work properly because We've made some assumptions about what's going into it or what's coming out to it, out from it, and that these assumptions are slightly incorrect. And the plant is the, the place where it's installed. So we've done system testing. Uh, as programmers, we know that our system works well. The next stage is acceptance testing. And usually, usually this is where we hand the system over to the customers and say, is this acceptable? If the customer finds it acceptable, then they've probably got to pay for it at this stage. And this is the stage where we tend to find defects in which the product doesn't fulfill its requirements. And sometimes we find defects, no, often we find defects in the requirement specification. The requirement specification is the thing that's been agreed between the customer and the programmer. It's where the customer says, I want X, Y, and Z. We write this X, Y, and Z down in a requirement specification. The customer has said, yeah, yeah, that's what I want. And we go and create a system. Now we give the system back to the customer. And the customer says, yeah, actually, that's not quite what I wanted. So we go back to the requirement specification. And we say, yeah, but this is the requirement specification you've agreed. And the customer says, oh, yeah, but that's actually, yeah, I, I made a mistake. That's not really what I want. And you've just spent you know, weeks or months or years creating this system. It's not a great thing to find out. And this is usually when you find this out. Actually, I could talk a lot more about that, but I won't. That's project management. OK, so let's look a bit more about the testing itself, black box, white box and incremental or non-incremental testing. So black box testing is where you've got this box. We don't look inside it. We just look at what goes in and what comes out. We know that we can't test everything. We can't test every possible input value in this in any real system. It would be too complicated. So we tend to um, scale the testing down. And we do something called equivalence partitioning or boundary value analysis. Let's look at that. <laughs> 
Equivalence partitioning is where we take the inputs and for each input, we divide that input into different ranges. Um, a very simple one is into a, a valid range and an invalid range. And for each of those ranges, we just test that um, one or more times. The example below is that we have a black box and it's got a voltage range it can accept between zero and five volts. Well, we can see two types of range here. If we're putting an input in that has a voltage between zero and five, that's a valid input range. And then if we put a voltage in that's above five or below zero, that's an invalid input range. So we can actually partition the input values to that black box into three partitions, just right, too high or too low. And then we can test each of those partitions. When we have a test case, we test stuff that's in the valid range and we make sure we have some tests that are in the invalid ranges. And this is good and it tends to work well, but if we know about the software more if we have more of an idea of what it's doing, we can improve that by testing boundary cases. Okay, And boundary cases are where we look at the equivalent partitions and we test just around it. So for example, when we're testing the valid range in that example from the previous page, and we don't just test some values between zero and five, we test the value of exactly zero and exactly five. And for the invalid ranges, we don't just test something above 5 or below 0. We test something which is just a little bit above 5 and something which is just a little bit below 0. That means our tests are just on the boundaries between these partitions. And that's because often inside the software, or hardware for that matter, it's when you're right at the edge of a partition that problems occur. This is very commonly used. White box testing, that's where we look inside the box. It can have different um, types, which include uh, logic coverage testing, where we uh, look at how the software is structured and we take every possible path through that, that um, software. Or for example, we have different functions, we make sure we test every function. There's something called statement coverage, where we test every possible statement in that. Um, it's not always possible, but if we can, we, we go through the, the software and we test its coverage. By coverage, you imagine that you're looking at your piece of software, you're looking at your code, and it's all colored in black. And you do a test, and the bit you've just tested becomes colored in red. So some of your code now is in red, some of it's in black. You do another test and some more of it gets colored in red. And you keep doing that. At the end of testing, you look at your software. Is it all red? I mean, has it all been tested? Or are there any little bits still left in black that haven't been tested? If there's anything that hasn't been tested, then you design a test case just for that. Decision coverage, if you've got branches, you know, is x equal to 1 or is y true, you make sure that for each one of those you have a test where y is true and a test where y is false, or a test where x equals 1 and a test where x doesn't equal 1. Condition coverage testing is very similar, but you might have a range of conditions. If you've got a um, switch case statement in C, then you could have one test and multiple out, uh, multiple pieces of code are executed depending on that test. And you make sure that when you have a test case, you go through each one of those bits of code. Non-incremental testing, I think it's a terrible idea, but it's called Big Bang. You write your code and then you just test everything. Uh, you can imagine you spend a year writing some software and then you're gonna spend another year testing. I don't think it's great. But people do this, and in doing that, they, they need to make sure they write a test driver for every function, and they do something which is called creating a test stub. So the difference between these things are, is if you have a function in your code, your code is calling that function. A test driver takes that function, 
and just tests it without the rest of the code. A test stub tests the rest of that code and it replaces the function. So the code is tested without that function. And typically for Big Bang testing, you'll test every function individually and then you combine them and do final integration tests. Now, if you have military standard software or software where it's absolutely critical that there are no errors, this sometimes can be very good. One example is shown here. Uh, there's a main function and there's three sub functions and each of those three sub functions can call something else um, two of them uh, are calling functions shown here and in this case the test is going to need to write six test drivers and six test stubs think about this they're going to have to write a test driver to test the measure function they're going to have to write a test driver to test the read temp function the control function, the shutdown power function, and then the measure current and the measure voltage functions. So these are the test drivers they need to write, but they also need to write some test stubs. One here, one here, one here, one here, one here, and one here. And they'll need to run 13 tests at least, maybe more. The 13 tests are six tests with the test drivers, six tests with the test stubs, and one overall integration test. They might test more than that, but that's the minimum. It's exhaustive, but good. Incremental testing is where you test as you go along, generally. And it can start with the highest module, which is called top down, and we can start with the lowest modules, which is bottom up. So, starting with the highest module, you create your main function, and then you call the sub functions and you write stubs to replace the sub functions. Main works perfectly. Okay, it's time to take those stubs and for the first stub, take it away and put a function there. And if that function calls other functions and there's test stubs there, which you will then replace and test incrementally. So you have a tree and you, spend, you expand down the tree. Bottom-up testing is the opposite, where you start with the smallest modules, which you've designed your software design process, and you, you create a module and test it. You test it by having a test function. Um, you exercise that function in a piece of test code and when you know that that function works well, then you plug it into the function that calls it. And you progress up the tree. There's uh, other things that we can do. Facility testing is where we um, need to test everything that's mentioned in the system requirements. It's also called functional testing. There's something called volume testing, where if we've got something which has I-O, then we just try it for a long, long time. It's quite common in practice for us to write software, especially for embedded systems, that works great for a few minutes and then it just falls over. And this is because it probably has a memory leak, a number one cause of systems to work, which work for a while and then suddenly fail. Stress testing is where you just have a system then you try it at maximum load. This is the problem with the Tharac 25. Yes, it was tested when you're typing slowly, but when you type really quickly, nobody had tested it. It's also very important for internet or network-based systems, systems that have internet traffic. A denial of service attack is when the traffic is so high the system falls over. We need to stress test a system to make sure it can cope with the maximum possible amount of input. And usability testing is you test user interface options and the, the thing that any tester knows, any software tester knows, is that you can test all you like in the lab. And you can get a piece of software that works perfectly in the lab. Give it to the customer, and it will fail the first day. It's very common. When we do system testing, we can test its performance, we can test the reliability, and we can test recovery. Recovery is that if something goes wrong, 
can the software recover? For example, does if the software crashes and you try to run it again, will it work properly? It's surprisingly common to have software that after it crashes, it just never works again. Reliability testing, well, how easy is it to make the software crash? How long does it work before it does crash? There's some other things at the bottom of the page here. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but you could test storage, compatibility, serviceability, and so on. These are important for different types of systems. So what we learned in this uh, segment of teaching today is the principles of testing, and whether that's dynamic or static. We looked at the methodology of testing, and in particular black box, where we have a sealed box that we don't look inside, or white box where we look inside, and then when we take that code, we go through that code and we test it as it's being built incrementally, or perhaps non-incrementally, a Big Bang testing approach. And finally, we looked at the aspects of system testing and different things we can test. So that's just a brief overview. It's not looking at how we debug things. That's something we'll do separately. But testing is such a big and important topic. This is just a taster. So I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you.